live from our hurricane headquarters with real-time analysis from some of the nation's top meteorologists. This is Tracking the Tropics, powered by Bose Electric. We haven't even gotten to our July 4th barbecues yet, and we have a Category 5 hurricane in the Caribbean. Hurricane Barrel, a force to be reckoned with, with Jamaica and other nations two hours south racing for the worst in the coming days we have a track update an interactive q a on this edition of tracking the tropics powered by bose electric hello there to you folks jb here with you live in your hurricane headquarters with uh, of course uh, meteorologist rebecca barry and our featured meteorologist today dave nussbaum joining us from cbs 42 in of course birmingham alabama friend of the program can't wait to get dave involved in the conversation here the tropics are active uh, before we send Rebecca to the wall, we're going to be answering your questions in the next couple of minutes. Use any of the hashtags you see on your screen. Hashtag Hey Dave, hashtag Hey JB, or of course, hashtag Hey Rebecca for Rebecca Barry. And Rebecca, yeah, Barrel was category five or four mm -hmm. 24 hours ago. Yeah. Now we're up to category five. Absolutely. So it's the earliest category five storm we've ever seen on record by about two weeks. So this is the most powerful storm to ever form this early. It's it intensified about 95 miles per hour in just 48 hours. And so this is Barrel right here, that category five storm. It has cleared the Windward Islands. And we're also monitoring, and we'll get to it in just a moment. The system behind it now has about a 30% chance to develop. And so we're not looking at an as likely likely chance for it to develop as we move into the next couple of days. But the latest on Hurricane Barrel, this track came out at 11 o'clock. We're still seeing the maximum wind sustained at 160 miles per hour. That minimum central pressure continuing to stay steadily low. What we're really fascinating about this storm is how fast it's moving That in terms of fast forward motion. It's moving to the west-northwest at 22 miles per hour. And with typical storms, when they're moving that fast, it's difficult for them to intensify. It's difficult for them to stay organized. Now, in Barrel's favor, it's moving moved over a nearly friction-free environment. Not a lot of interaction with land, even as it made its way over the Windward Islands. That just wasn't much. And it's staying pretty far to the south of Puerto Rico, Hispaniola, and Haiti. But the outermost bands are certainly making an impact there, but nothing in terms of the hurricane force winds. And so the latest track keeps it at a Category 5 for the rest of the afternoon, but by 8 o'clock this evening, down to a Category 4 storm. But it is only a slight decrease at this point, down from 160 mile per hour sustained winds to 155 mile per hour sustained winds. So still an incredibly powerful storm. When we wake up tomorrow morning, we're looking at 140 mile per hour sustained winds, still a Category 4 as it approaches Jamaica. And so it's supposed to move over Jamaica, weakening to a Category 3 storm. And right now, it looks like mo most of Jamaica is in the track. We could actually end up seeing a true landfall in Jamaica. And so landfall occurs when the eye actually moves over, not when we're seeing the, the outermost rain bands move into Hispaniola. That's not considered a landfall, but we might actually get a landfall. So Jamaica is really the next one buckling up for the worst of this storm. The only good news with Barrel is how fast it's moving. So conditions will rapidly deteriorate and then rapidly improve because this storm is moving so fast. It's not one of those situations uh, like where we saw this, one of those systems sitting over the islands in the Bahamas for a day. This is going to move in and move out very quickly. This is Wednesday 8 a.m. the position. This is Wednesday 8 p.m. the position of the center. And so we still have the, another half of the storm to get through there. But... Right now, the National Hurricane Center does expect wind shear to really take a toll on this system. That's still a big factor. We're going to notice that. We'll, we'll know if the National Hurricane Center is factoring the shear in at a correct level if we see it weakening to a Category 3 by tomorrow afternoon. If not, then all bets are off because it's moving over such warm waters as well. And so right now, the National Hurricane Center is calling it for to weaken to a Category 2 storm by Thursday morning. So for the 4th of July, a Category 2 storm weakening to a Category 1 storm barreling towards Cancun and Cozumel for another landfall there. And then a final landfall as a tropical storm over the weekend, somewhere between southern Texas and Mexico, another big rainmaker in areas that have gotten rainmaker after rainmaker after rainmaker, starting with Alberto and most recently Chris. And so this is a very soaked area with another base, big wallop of rain headed that way. So this is the latest track, and I pointed out where I thought the potential changes might be if we don't see the wind shear, especially during the day tomorrow, weakening the system. We're going to be dealing with a very different intensity forecast as it moves towards Mexico. 
I was looking at this earlier because even we were getting a lot of questions yesterday on tracking the tropics on what can Puerto Rico expect, what can Hispaniola expect, then the Dominican. And so this is the wind field. And so the yellow is tropical storm force winds above 39 miles per hour. Once it gets above 60 miles per hour, it's coated in orange because that is considered severe winds. And once it gets to red, that is considered the hurricane force winds. And so it is a compact field of those category four and category five winds, but we can expect tropical storm force winds between 39 and 59 miles per hour in Southern Hispaniola as it passes there. Uh, unfortunately, Jamaica right in the middle of the hurricane force winds if it takes the center of the track. And so we can't expect category three to category two storm force winds over Jamaica during the day and into the afternoon hours on Wednesday. It moves on, Georgetown getting swiped there as well, just to the south of Cuba. And then as it makes its way towards Mexico, now we're done with the hurricane force winds for the most part and just in time for landfall. We're still dealing with severe winds, so anywhere between 60 and 73 miles per hour in that wind field there with 39 mile per hour winds widespread from Cancun all the way down to Tulum. And then as it makes its way back into the Gulf, this is a very warm, ripe area as well. We could see some organization or intensification, but right now the National Hurricane Center's forecast keeps it a tropical storm as it makes its way towards the Texas-Mexico line there over the weekend. And so that gives you a better idea of what areas can expect that are getting scraped by it or that it's in, in its path, not that Category 4 wallop like we saw over some of the islands. It's intensifying to a Category 5. Look, it lines up with that warm-up, and so you can see it move from high closer to extreme available ocean energy. So this is the energy that the ocean's providing just based on the sea surface temperatures, and it's moving into an even more extreme area. And so this is why everyone's watching to see if this year is going to do what we expect this year to do, because if it doesn't do that, we have a ton of available potential energy. It's moving over some of the warmest waters on the globe to the south of Cuba as it makes its way closer to Jamaica and then eventually towards Mexico. Com you know, think about how warm our Gulf is. Look how the warm Gulf waters are compared to this water. So extreme heat is what this system will be moving over. And it does coincide with when we expect it to be getting shear, which shear weakens storms. But that is a big question mark in the forecast right now. We have a high confidence in the path. I don't have a high confidence in that weakening of intensity, uh, that, that weaker intensification, especially since it's moving over such warm Warm waters. We always love Saharan dust on tracking the tropics, so I wanted to show you that behind Beryl, we do have, this is where Beryl is right now, we do have a plume of Saharan dust, and that's part of what that 96L is ensconced by, and so that secondary system looking less and less likely to develop. Behind Beryl, we're going to bring in a swath of that Saharan dust even into the Gulf, even into the weekend and next week with another plume of Saharan dust on the way. So we do love our Saharan dust because typically with Saharan dust comes conditions that are least conducive for storm formations. And so it's not the dust that does it, but we still love it's a great visual and it also gives us those vibrant sunsets. So a little bit of dust headed our way, maybe give us a little bit of a break. This is 96L, the system behind Barrel. Barrel's right here right now. This is the system we've been tracking behind it with the potential to, to develop, but every single day that potential to develop has gone down. And you can see through the satellite here, it is not organized at all. But this forecast models do show it taking an extremely similar path if, whether it develops or whether it doesn't. We have a ridge of high pressure over the southeast right now, and that has almost closed the Gulf off from those systems turning up into the Gulf, and it's pushing them into southern Texas and Mexico. Now, those that ridge of high pressure can't last forever, but we're really enjoying it right now locally because it is keeping those storms away from the Florida Peninsula. The next storm to develop will be Debbie. You might have missed Chris. Chris formed late Sunday afternoon into the evening hours, very close to the Mexican border in the southern Gulf, and then by Monday it was nothing. And so it was just a rainmaker for them, but it did take another name off the list. The next name will be Debbie. It does look like this could be one of those seasons where we run through the names and have to go to that secondary name list. And we talked a little bit about this yesterday, but I just wanted to bring it up one more time. We have such record warmth in the Atlantic right now. We're looking at a... a system that looks like what we would typically expect in late August and September when our sea surface temperatures are normally this hot over the Atlantic, but it's so hot so early, we're not seeing formation in the typical zones for July, even into August. 
It's not until late August we see this is where Barrow formed and this is where 96L is, even though it's probably not going to form. And so this is more like a late, a, a mid-season to late-season formation pattern for us. This is what we see in September, and so that's when the Bermuda High moves a little bit further north, and a lot of times the Outer Banks start to come into play because of the position of the Bermuda High. But it does look like we're, we've got an early jump on the season, and so the question is, will we move into our September, October, and November formation pattern zones a little bit earlier since we got such an early start on this one. And so our average tropical activity does ramp up as we head into the middle of September. We're actually pretty close in terms of named storms, just a little above named storms on average by this time of the year. It's the intensity that's really throwing us off with the storms this season. And so uh, unfortunately that available potential energy for the heat is really, really a huge factor for us. And I think it's going to be one of those things we have to watch. Who's going to win, the wind shear or that available ocean energy as barrel starts to make its way over Jamaica tomorrow? Meteorologist Rebecca Barry with the latest on the forecast. I want to bring in uh, CBS 42 meteorologist Dave Nussbaum. Dave, I I've seen we, we caution our audience uh, when it comes to tracking a storm like this uh, to not always believe what you see on social media. Uh, social media, of course, can be right with misinformation. But the long term barrel models, uh, is what are the consequences for the United States, Texas or beyond? Well, right now, once it gets past the uh, Northwest Caribbean toward the Yucatan Peninsula, that's what we'll be watching to see, one, how strong it is when it goes into the Yucatan Peninsula, two, how fast is it moving, because it is moving fast, as Rebecca said, uh, moving at 22 miles per hour. Typically, a storm at this intensity, you're talking 15, 17 miles per hour max uh, with it. So this one's really moving, uh, which can be good and bad uh, because for the islands, it means it's good. It doesn't last too long, of course, here, but uh, it could hold its intensity longer. Uh, that wind shear, uh, Rebecca was talking about, that's going to be key. If it can be strong enough and overcome the intense uh, ocean heat content, the water there in the Caribbean, and it weakens it enough, if it spends enough time over the Yucatan, when it emerges in the Bay of Campeche there, you know, hopefully it's just a tropical storm and still battling wind shear and organizational problems and then just becoming a rainmaker uh, once we get into parts there of um, Mexico or southern Texas. But there is a spread in the models. And so it's all going to be that you heard Rebecca talk about this ridge of high pressure, mostly blocking the Gulf. Uh, I think she was alluding to maybe the far western Gulf, the Texas coast could see some piece of this if it would be kind of wrapping around that high, the backside of that high pressure. Um, however, not near the intensity it is right now. I think it could be a big rainmaker for Texas, and they probably could use a little rain. It's pretty dry over there. We're going to get to your questions that are coming in on Facebook Live in just a moment here. Final question that I want to ask for Rebecca and Dave. I, I mean, when we're talking about Jamaica here, mm -hmm. we, we are talking like, I mean, this is a bullseye sort of scenario, right? I, I mean, is it worst case scenario given where we are in the, in the calendar year? I can't think of a, a worst case um, in, in recent memory for sure. I can't really envision a worse, uh, unfortunate uh, approach, this, the way that the storm is approaching. Most of the island will be on what we call the dirty side of the storm. And with the hurricane force winds that are expected there, I expect it will take years for that community to recover. Yeah, definitely. It's it's. Every update keeps creeping that little bit further north and, you know, five, 10 miles makes a difference with a storm this size. And so, yeah, I mean, it, it unfortunately making a beeline toward it. I'm sure they're taking preparations as we speak uh, for this. If there's any saving grace, it may only be a category three versus a five, but that's still, you know, 120, 130, almost mile per hour winds. That can cause some problems. Let's get to our meteorologist Q&A. Of course, use a hashtag that you see on your screen. Hashtag Hey Rebecca, hashtag Hey Dave, or hashtag Hey JB, and we can feature your comment on screen just like this. Hashtag Hey Rebecca, Daily Dion on the WFLA Facebook page. Yes, we were just talking about this. Will this be a direct hit uh, for Jamaica? I think it's uh, you alluded to it during your forecast, Rebecca. 
uh, the center of the eye crossing over Jamaica would make it a second landfall event mm -hmm. for Beryl. Uh, the odds of that happening at this stage are what exactly? They're they're higher than we thought yesterday. It's probably at least a 60 or 70 percent chance um, unless we start to see that storm wobbling. You know, wobbles are possible, but there's just not a lot of friction. Uh, this system's not interacting with land masses. There's not a lot going on that would inhibit it or cause it to change path. And so with the current track, it does look like a, an inevitable landfall in Jamaica. Yeah, right across the entire length of the eye. Now, there are mountains there, you know, of course, there is a higher elevation, but still, it's at that point, it's already making landfall there. You can see from a four to a three, I mean, still split the difference, 130 mile per hour winds, and that's going to cause big problems. But even if it, even if it doesn't hit directly, it, it could miss a landfall by a few miles to the south. We're still talking about catastrophic damage. Yeah, and so I'll try to get to the wind field graphic we had, and that shows where the hurricane force winds are, because this is a pretty compact storm, relatively speaking. So you're just getting the yellow, which is tropical storm force winds as it moves to the path south of Hispaniola. But look at the hurricane force wind field over Jamaica. I mean, it's, it's almost That's, over half the island. We're talking about point. a bullseye. You're literally looking at a bullseye over Kingston right, right now. I mean, that's that's um yeah worst case scenario for jamaica let's go to roly uh on the wfla facebook page hashtag hey rebecca again use any of our hashtags right now on facebook live and we can put your comment on screen uh will it make it as a cat five into the gulf and no. that's not expected right now because of in wind shear that it's expected to encounter it's hard for a storm to stay a cat five strength for days at a time and so that's the only solace is that we typically see uh storms building up to that strength and then eventually starting to fade even if it's not in encountering a ton of wind shear and we do expect it to encounter wind shear at, especially as it passes jamaica that's when it starts to get into the heavier areas of wind shear and so we are watching carefully because it's moving over such warm waters it's the battle between the wind shear and warm waters but what wind shear does is it essentially cuts off the top of the storm and so hurricanes maintain strength and intensify by vertical development and so for that vertical development to be hindered or interrupted it doesn't matter how much energy is there if it can't structurally continue to distribute that energy into the storm and it looks like based off of the data the hurricane hunter has been sitting back it may have peaked already intensity yesterday or early this morning um so that it's a good sign that's not to say it couldn't just overcome it's that wind shear i mean but this wasn't light wind shear i think the latest the models were saying 25 30 knots which is doesn't sound like much when you're talking about a 160 mile per hour hurricane but that's enough to just disrupt it enough make it look messier and uh, not as symmetric Let's do a two for one here because we got two talking about uh, water temperatures. Uh, a featured comment here from Robin using hashtag AJB is the water temperature making it worse. And yeah, I think it's pretty safe to say based on Rebecca's forecast that we're dealing with extreme water temperatures that are making Beryl the monster that it is. And then David uh, asking as well, with the storm moving through, Will it cool waters? And this is uh, this is a great science-based question, right? Because the idea is that all that rainfall comes down. Will it cool off that area of extremely hot ocean? Yeah, and so it's not just the rainfall, although the rainfall helps. The low-pressure system itself pulls up cooler waters from below the surface. You can actually track it on sea surface temperature maps right behind a hurricane. It'll be, you know, a little spot of cooler water all the way along. Now, this storm's moving so fast, it's not nearly having the effect I would like it to. If this were chugging along at two or three miles per hour, we'd be looking at much cooler waters in its wake. But it is going to cool off things a little bit. And so that's the one of the other small positives we're seeing from it. Yeah, the upwelling we'd love to see, you know, bringing up the the deeper water back up, but moving at 22 miles per hour, it, I mean, it's not spending much time there, unfortunately. We have a commenter for what it's worth, and it's it can be very difficult to to obviously pinpoint where people are watching from. But we have a commenter on Facebook Live saying that they're joining us right now from Jamaica and saying it's not even really raining there just yet. It's just kind of you know empty skies, but that's 
I mean, look, that's going to change, no doubt. Yeah, it's going to be very different in 24 hours. Conditions are going to deteriorate very rapidly. They will also improve very rapidly behind the storm because it's moving so fast. But what you worry about with communities like Jamaica is the resources to get people out that can't survive an, ele- uh, an environment without electricity. You just don't have that many time, that much time and that many resources to get people off of the island that have to get off of the island. We have a few more uh, questions in, in the queue, but this is going to be a last call you see the hashtags on the silver stripes all around your screen hashtag hey rebecca hashtag hey dave hashtag hey jb i'm keep my eye here on the facebook live comment section uh with of course two uh phenomenal meteorologists right in the palm of your hand you can use those hashtags to ask a question about hurricane barrel about invest 96l or just the tropics in general uh, we're always talking about tropics education here on this program if you have a question about hurricanes or tropical storms uh, now is the time to drop it into the facebook live comment section just use one of those hashtags and it'll be alerted to us here uh, in the stream center. Let's go to Tabitha, hashtag KJB. Do you anticipate this storm speeding up to move faster when it hits the warmer water? Do you think it will slow down and weaken over Jamaica? We talk on this program, Rebecca, all the time about the importance of speed. You want, if you're, if you're in Jamaica right now, mm-hmm. you want this to go as fast as possible over you. If it sits, of course, over you at, let's say, five miles per hour, that is even more devastating than what we're currently looking at. So maybe we can answer Tabitha's question here from Facebook Live. And so the warmer water doesn't necessarily make the the forward motion of the storm faster. It could help increase the wind speeds within the storm, because just providing that extra energy. But the fast forward motion is pretty unusual with the storm, and you would want it to stay as fast as possible. You don't want to be looking at a Dorian situation where it's just sitting in the same area. And there's no indication that it would be slowing down at this point. Once again, there's nothing in this system's way. There's not a lot of land, not a lot of mountains, not a lot of friction. It's just cruising through the warmest, smoothest waters it could find. And it's being steered by what's pushing behind it. Same thing you were showing, uh, Rebecca, the um, the Saharan dust and how it's worked its way from Africa across the Caribbean eventually uh, to the uh, Mexico area. That same motion of steering that's pushing the dust is pushing the hurricane. Uh, When it runs into resistance, that's when things start to slow down. So it may actually slow down once it gets over toward Mexico or Yucatan Peninsula area. But uh, I, I don't see faster movement motion right now rebecca with a question for all of us including rebecca any uh chance this thing gets to the warm water and changes course to hit florida luckily those two uh factors the warm water and the the track are are not that related the warm water provides the energy whereas this this system's being steered by as dave just mentioned the the general wind pattern from africa across the atlantic and then what we've got sitting on top of us is a ridge of high pressure and air goes clockwise around high pressure and so that's just steering this system into the southern gulf and not allowing it to make that turn into the gulf but just based on the wind patterns there so it's my current favorite high pressure i don't know about you dave (laughs) <laughs> yes. Well, the only negative to the hot is that we're going to be dealing with the heat up here. You guys have at least the uh, sea breezes to cool you down a little bit. Uh, but yes, that's also what's baking the whole Southeast United States temperatures, mid upper nineties. Uh, but that's a good thing uh, when it comes to hurricanes. I mean, not that we want our friends and neighbors there in Mexico to feel the wrath of it, but uh, it keeps us safe at least for now. So when you see that, that's good. Now you showed, I think graphic earlier showing, um, per month where the steering tracks are. And uh, typically when you have that famous Bermuda high, uh, the closer it sits to the United States, the better chance these storms curve around into the Gulf and hit. Uh, So we don't have that right now and we'll take it. Next comment from Vanessa, hashtag, hey, Rebecca, what causes a hurricane to sit on top of an island for so long? I remember Maria stayed over Puerto Rico for hours and hours and and yeah doing a little bit of uh, you know checking of the weather almanac hurricane maria back september of 2017 so that was uh, wow that was eight uh, years ago now Uh, vanessa with this comment about uh, what causes a hurricane to sit for so long in one place and co- so hurricanes typically stall out or sit when they've run into a blocking ridge or some type of high pressure when the e- either the steering currents that were originally pushing it have have weakened to the point that they're no longer pushing it or they've run into a ridge a lot of times these systems will will pause and then make a turn some in later in the season sometimes it's cold fronts uh, otherwise it can be areas of high pressure that it, it's kind of running into and up against and not not able to create its own forward motion 
Yeah, so th that one, again, was not moving at 22 miles per hour, just hit the brakes. It just never was a fast mover to start with. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, it leashed incredible damage to Puerto Rico. But uh, it was also a little later in the season, too. So you have different stirring, steering currents than you do here beginning of July. Again, this is unprecedented, right? I mean, we, we have not seen anything in the history this strong this early in the hurricane season. And by no means does that mean the rest of the season is going to be like this either. Let's get to this question from, oh, no, that was Vanessa. We had Vanessa. Let's go to Rachel. Uh, hashtag hey JB from Rachel. Do you expect this storm to change direction to hit the United States at all, like Texas or Florida? Texas is in play here, right? I mean, yeah. uh, southern Texas, but... Florida, we can we can say with confidence, is just not going to get really impacted. Something drastic would have to change, and that's not likely or even really that possible at this point in the forecast. But southern Texas is in play. At that point, we do expect it to be more of a rainmaker and less of the storm that we're looking at on radar. Yeah, South Padre I may see a little bit of a surge maybe coming from it. Um, but uh, outside of that, that, right now... Uh, the water is not quite near as warm in the Southern Gulf, which is good. Um, but uh, I think it's going to be more of a mess, kind of like uh, Alberto was that brought all that rain there to South Texas. Well, we really appreciate everybody joining us on this edition of Tracking the Tropics. Final word goes to our featured meteorologist joining us from Birmingham, Alabama, Dave Nussbaum from CBS 42, our next star sister station. Uh, Dave, uh, talking Barrel, talking 96L, uh, some of the other you know, hurricane headlines, if you will, that we've been paying attention to this season on Track in the Tropics. What are you going to be paying attention to in Birmingham over the course of the season? Well, we're obviously watching the golf closely. I mean, typically we tip, don't see much this soon. Uh, we do have, uh, you know, once we get into August and September, that's kind of our go time. I mean, obviously you all, you all in Florida have to deal with that more than we do. Uh, but uh, we'll be watching to see how these interact, these storms. If this is the track we're going to see this season coming through the Caribbean and where that high sets up as to whether or not we'll be impacted. Uh, this year's the 20th uh, anniversary of Ivan hitting Gulf Shores, Alabama, uh, as a major hurricane and causing significant damage down there. So it, we can get storms here. Uh, and when they come through during August, September time frame can be pretty intense. So all going to be what the weather pattern globally looks like, where that high sets up. Obviously, the Gulf's going to get very warm as it typically does, so that's a given. Uh, but the best we can hope is that the La Nina, which is going to be setting up this fall, takes a little longer to develop. And that would mean here we wouldn't have um, perfect conditions for the hurricanes. Uh, but that's definitely something we'll be watching all season long. I definitely want to uh, try to get in. Don, I, I got you covered. I, I told Dave that he'd have the final word, but I want to get this in real quick uh, because, hey, look, we all have cruises are expensive. Vacations mm -hmm. down to the Caribbean or or to Mexico, they can get expensive. So uh, Don says that she's going on a cruise on the 4th to Mexico. I'm sure that others are using the July 4th holiday to their cruise advantage. Um, well, I mean, what do we, I mean, we don't know where in Mexico, Dawn, but we'll do our best here. Yeah. So let's go ahead and pop the track back up so we can try to, so in case we're not covering the area of Mexico that you're going to properly. And so Thursday, but 8 a.m., this system is not quite, uh, it's probably not even raining in Cancun in Mexico and Cancun and Cozumel just yet. Um, it's just, just to the south of Cuba. And so it probably gets pretty stormy there. Thursday night into Friday morning, but it's back in the Gulf by Saturday morning. And so it's a weakening system at this point. I And so if you're departing from like the Tampa area on the 4th, you're probably not getting to Mexico until the 5th. And at that point, it does look pretty rainy on the 5th in Cancun and Cozumel. Uh, one thing cruise ships are excellent at is driving around storms. You may rearrange your day at sea to be in the beginning of the cruise instead of the end or something like to that effect. Or you may stop in the Keys or something to avoid storms. But they want you to have fun, stay on the ship, not get sick. And I, I'm confident that your cruise company will do that. Yeah, I, I, they're going to, of course, make sure that... Uh you stay safe and have as best of a time as humanly possible while steering uh, clear of Hurricane Barrel. Uh, Dave Nussbaum, our featured meteorologist from CBS 42. We appreciate his time. Of course, the expertise, as always, of meteorologist Rebecca Barry. I'm JB here in the Stream Center. We continue to monitor Hurricane Barrel, and you can do so on trackingthetropics.tv. We have all of our uh, Tracking the Tropics episodes and coverage there. Also, uh, some of the tools that we use here with the Max Fender 8 weather team at WFLA, you can find on that website as well. Uh, Barrel, right now, a Category 5 storm, 
and no for all the people that ask in our comment section is category six possible i'll just tell you right now no category five is the peak we're not getting up to category six but of course we expect it to weaken to a category four uh, really over the course of the next 24 to 36 hours you can see it there on the track everything that we're talking about here you can find on our website trackingthetropics.tv we are live for our regularly scheduled episodes uh tuesday 12 30 eastern 1130 central we also have additional episodes when storms form thanks so much for joining us for tracking the tropics and we'll see you next time here from the stream center in tampa florida Find Tracking the Tropics on these platforms. And for storm updates, the latest models, and helpful resources, visit trackingthetropics.tv.